Welcome to our online service today. We are glad you're joining us. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue together and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. The reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, 
Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Bible is filled with very interesting characters. One of those characters is Jacob in the Old Testament. In essence, Jacob was a bit of a scoundrel, a schemer, and a trickster. You wonder why people like that even make it into the pages of the Bible. The circumstances of Jacob's birth, his interactions with his twin brother Esau and his father Isaac are all, how should I put it, a bit shady. You find his story in the book of Genesis starting at chapter 25. There are many twists and turns to the story, sort of like a Netflix TV series. But anyway, Jacob finds himself in trouble once again and has to escape far away from his brother who wants to kill him. He has to leave his homeland. In such a hurry, he finds himself with nothing but the clothes he is wearing. One night, he goes to sleep using a rock for a pillow. You know that you're pretty down and out. Times are difficult when you use a rock as a pillow. And that night, he has a significant dream. He sees a ladder with its foot on the earth and its top reaching into heaven. The angels of God are going up and coming down on the ladder. Then the Lord promises Jacob that he would bring him back to his homeland where he will experience grace, peace, and prosperity. It's a hopeful promise. I begin by sharing this biblical account because it is connected to our passage today. Let's pray before we take a closer look. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, when we were looking at the story of Jesus' baptism, it says that immediately after he came out of the water, the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. Heavens, or heaven in the Bible, often means God's dimension beyond ordinary natural reality. As one author explains it, he says, it is more as though an invisible curtain right in front of us suddenly is pulled back, so that instead of the computer screen or television or living room, or in Jesus' case, the River Jordan and its banks, we are standing in the presence of a different reality, a spiritual reality. And I think that a good deal of our faith is a matter of learning how to live and appreciate this different reality, which I believe is all around us. There's more to life than meets the eye. In today's passage, we're going to see another example of the power of the Holy Spirit and there's more to life 
than meets the eye. But first of all, Jesus calling the first disciples. Notice how Jesus takes the initiative and calls Philip. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. This gives us a clue on how the universe works. Many people put the wrong emphasis in their faith journey. I found the Lord. I came to faith in Jesus when I was a child. I was searching for God. But here we see the Lord Jesus taking the initiative. And I think the Gospel writer John is making a point, which will run throughout his Gospel narrative. Just as he already described Jesus in chapter 1, verse 14, as one who is filled with grace and truth, here is another example of grace. God stepping into human history in Jesus. God stepping into Philip's life as Jesus calls him, follow me. We have a Lord who is constantly calling out to his people. Do you hear his voice? Then the passage tells us that Philip approaches Nathanael. Now Philip is a fast learner. Now he's taking the initiative. In effect, Philip is saying to Nathanael, come and see Jesus. Now that's a great line that we should copy. In fact, wouldn't that be a good tagline for our church? Come and see Jesus. It certainly is a good Alpha Course invitation. Come and see Jesus. Come and see that he is real. Next, we see Jesus encountering Nathanael. Now, I mentioned the story about Jacob in the Old Testament because it is this passage that Jesus seems to be referring to when he says to Nathanael, jumping ahead to verse 51, and Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. How does that relate to Nathanael? What is going on here, and what can we learn? Now, this will take a bit of unpacking, so please be patient with me. The point of the story about Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament was that it showed that God was with Jacob in that place. But just a quick side note here from Genesis chapter 28. It says, After Jacob woke up from his dream, with the ladder, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. Now hold that in the back of your mind, because we're going to come back to it later on. Jacob called the place where he had that dream Bethel, which means God's house. Many years later, when Jacob and his descendants returned to his homeland, remember God promised him that he would do that, Bethel became one of the sanctuaries of Israel, one of the places where early organized Israelite worship was conducted. So, the traditional story of Jacob's dream of the angels going up and coming down on the ladder would then be connected with the belief that when a person worshipped God in his house, Bethel, God was really present. Surely the Lord is in this place with even his angels coming and going to make the link between heaven and earth. Now I share this 
because here is a clue to understanding today's passage. The way John's gospel is put together points to how Jesus fulfills the promises made concerning the temple, God's house. There are hints, even in the opening lines of chapter 1, when you remember, we looked at this a, a couple of weeks ago, it says, So when the Word became human and made his home among us, or another translation has it, he tabernacled, he pitched his tent, he moved into the neighborhood with us. In other words, where Jesus is, you find God's presence. The meeting place between God and you and me is Jesus. In the next section, we are introduced to Nathaniel. Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now we get a bit of a clue of Nathaniel's character. He's a bit of a card. Nathaniel came from the town of Cana. He cannot believe that anything good would come out of a rival village, Nazareth, which is just a short distance away. And that's a bit of a human touch that we can obviously relate to. Our town is better than your town. We have a better hockey team than you, etc. Nathaniel is also pretty transparent. He says what he thinks. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And so he asked Jesus, How do you know me? He owns up. Yep, that's me, all right. He's an Israelite, in whom there is no deceit. Now, it's an interesting choice of words on Jesus' part. Nathaniel, it says, has no deceit. In contrast to Jacob, who I told you was a bit of a scoundrel. He was tricky and cunning. Now, back to our Old Testament pal, Jacob. Jacob's name later on became Israel. The conniving scoundrel Jacob becomes Israel after, after he wrestles with God. And you can check out that story later on in Genesis chapter 32. Here, Jesus calls out Nathanael's character before he even meets him. Something supernatural is going on here. There are spiritual realities at work. There's more to life than meets the eye. And so Nathanael asked Jesus, How do you know me? And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, this probably means that Jesus simply saw Nathanael, maybe in the distance, near a fig tree. Could be that. But let me look at this from a, an entirely different angle. Could Jesus mean something else? Maybe, in the past, Nathanael had a supernatural, spiritual experience that no one would know about near a fig tree. But Jesus knows it. He surely knows Nathaniel. God is all-knowing. Only God can know this kind of thing about Nathaniel. So, conclusion from Nathaniel, verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You're the one. He believed because he sees in Jesus the all-knowing nature of God. And Jesus answers him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. In other words, Nathaniel, 
You haven't seen anything yet. Last part. And Jesus says to Nathanael, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now just a little Greek text note here. Jesus switches from the singular, you, to you, plural. You, all, will see the heavens open. Remember when I mentioned that part in the story, when Jacob, after his dream of the ladder, realizes and says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't see it. I didn't see it. That, I believe, is the sad reality of much of the church today. That is the sad reality of many Christians' lives. Surely God is in this place, and we didn't even see it. We didn't realize his presence. We didn't see how he is working in our lives. We didn't realize God is close by. We didn't see the miracles. We didn't see the reality of heaven all around us. There's more to life than meets the eye. Remember what Jacob said. How awesome is this place? This is the gate of heaven. Now I see it. This is Bethel. The reality, folks, is that there is Bethel all around us. What a tragedy that we don't see it. We believe it, but do we believe it? Another interesting point in our passage today from John chapter 1 is when Jesus mentions in verse 51, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is obviously drawing from the story of Jacob in the book of Genesis. But notice here, there is no mention of a ladder. Now, many biblical scholars think that Jesus is, in fact, the ladder. The point being is that Jesus is the means of bridging the gap between earth and heaven above. What an encouragement from Jesus. This is a powerful word picture, an image that is easy for us to hold on to. And Jesus often used word pictures, parables, to explain spiritual realities. In other words, God is often closest when we think he's far away. When you and I are in Christ, when we believe in him, trust in him, God is close. You see, many of us have slept on a few stone pillows in life. We've been in those hard places, those difficult times in our lives. But God steps into that hard place and visits us with his presence. Today's passage has an element pointing to the ability to see. Jesus sees Philip, then calls him. Jesus sees Nathanael and speaks into his life. And when they respond to Jesus, he promises them that they will see the heavens open and angels and descended supernatural activity. There is more to life than meets the eye. Our faith in Jesus is not just about head knowledge. It's about knowing and hearing and sensing and seeing and experiencing the Lord's presence. Have you seen the Lord? If cor of course, if this is all strange to you and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you to turn to him right now, to invite him into your heart, to trust him that he can take away your sin 
and give you a new start in life and promise you eternal life in his forever kingdom. And I promise you, you will see the heavens open. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the calling of his disciples, for calling us to be part of your forever kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to give us spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, to know your presence among us. Father, for anyone who's watching this today, I pray that the love of the Father would enfold them, the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we bless you and we thank you. We pray all of these things in the very strong name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Let us with confidence present our prayers and supplications to the throne of grace. We pray for all those in positions of power, that they may govern with wisdom and integrity, serving the needs of their people. And in particular this week, we pray for our brothers and sisters to the south in the United States. We pray, Lord, for peace, for strong leadership, for the grace of the Lord Jesus to protect our dear brothers and sisters. May your reign come, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, the sign of your reign, that it may extend your welcome to people of every race and background. We continue to pray for the Anglican Network in Canada. We pray for Bishop Charlie and for Judy, for those in leadership within the Anglican Council. We ask you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy as we are in a time of transition we pray for the Electoral Nominating Committee in their search for a new bishop. We ask for your favor, Lord. And especially, Lord, we pray for unity within Anak. May your kingdom come, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the world and for those in our community. Again, Father, we pray during this these COVID days, Lord, especially with the lockdown. Father, in your great compassion, we cry out to you, Lord, that you would protect your people from COVID-19. Lord, that you would give us strength to continue on, to persevere during these difficult times. We pray your special grace on families for those who are out of work. May your kingdom come, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for each other and particularly intercede for those who are hurting. As a church at St. Hilda's, we bring before the Lord Jesus, our dear brother Morris, and we give thanks, Lord, for Eva, who's passed away this past week. We ask for your strength for Morris Lord, we thank you for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead, for the hope of glory, and we commit her to your forever care. Father, we pray for each other, especially people that are sick at this time, who are suffering, those who are out of work. We pray for the healing touch of the Lord Jesus on their lives. For all the various needs that we carry as a church, for ourselves, 
for our families and for our friends and for our community around us. May your kingdom come. Lord, hear our prayer. And gathering all our prayers, we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And praying together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your hum unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And my friends, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We pray God's rich blessing on this week.